The movie begins in a recording room where Agent Eric Olson questions Kevin Weeks, a former member of the infamous Winter Hill Gang in South Boston. Eric offers Kevin a deal, if he provides information about the Winter Hill Mafia, his jail sentence could be reduced. During the interrogation, they explore the gang's criminal activities, their ties to FBI agent John Connolly, and most importantly, the mastermind behind the operation, James Whitey Bulger. We are taken back to Boston in 1975, setting the stage for what's to come. Outside a bar, Kevin is embroiled in an argument, while inside, James Whitey Bulger strategizes with his associates, including Steve Flemmy, Whitey's right-hand man, John Martorano, the gang's hitman, and Tommy King. Whitey is summoned outside, where he discovers Kevin's disagreement has escalated into a physical altercation with Whitey's cousin. The next morning, Whitey asks Kevin to drive him and another man, a member of the Angiolo family, an Italian mafia in North Boston, to a secluded parking lot beside a lake. Fearing for his life, Kevin initially thinks Whitey intends to kill him. However, upon their arrival, it's the Angiolo member who is angrily questioning his presence there. Without warning, Whitey and Kevin attack him, leaving his body behind. After this grim task, Whitey formally welcomes Kevin into the Winter Hill Gang. Cut to a tender moment that reveals another element of Whitey's complex character, his interaction with an elderly woman on the streets of South Boston. This gesture of kindness amidst his ruthless world underscores the duality of his persona, respected and feared in equal measure. Kevin Weeks' voice narrates, painting a picture of Whitey's stature in the community and explaining why Whitey was highly respected in the South, especially by John Connolly, Whitey's childhood friend now an FBI agent. John Connolly, stepping into his new role at the Boston FBI office is met with applause and congratulations. Tasked with investigating the Angiolo family, he learns of their extensive criminal operations and responsibility for numerous deaths. Despite their notorious activities, the lack of witnesses allows them to often evade justice. John meets with Billy Bulger, who is not just a senator but also Whitey's brother. In their conversation, John tries to convince Billy to help him get Whitey on board with fighting the Angiolo family. Billy seems uninterested in getting involved with Whitey's criminal activities and suggests John should talk to Whitey directly. After some back and forth, Billy agrees to pass the message to Whitey about meeting John. That evening at their mother's house, Whitey is playing cards with her when Billy drops by. He tells Whitey about an FBI agent, John, who wants to meet him for some business talk. Later that night, John meets Whitey and proposes an alliance to dismantle the Angiolos who control the North. Although Whitey is not keen on becoming an informant for the FBI, John persists in trying to persuade him. He informs Whitey that the Angiolo gang leader wants to assassinate him, emphasizing that cooperation would be mutually beneficial. Whitey turns down the offer, making it clear he doesn't want anything to do with the FBI. During breakfast, Whitey discovers his son has been in a fight, having seriously hurt another child. Lindsay looks to Whitey, expecting him to offer some fatherly wisdom. Instead, Whitey advises their son to simply avoid getting caught next time by fighting out of the teacher's sight. Lindsay is visibly upset by this, concerned about the lessons they're passing on to their son. Whitey, however, appears indifferent to her worries, believing it's important for his kid to learn how to be street smart. Later, while Whitey and the Winter Hill gang are cruising around, they're stopped by a cop. The officer warns Whitey that the Angiolo gang put a hit on him for killing one of their own. Tommy unexpectedly intervenes, threatening to kill the cop for speaking in such a tone, but Whitey manages to defuse the situation, and they leave. That night at a bar, a drunk Tommy rants about wanting to get back at the cop. Whitey cautions him against it, saying it's a bad idea, which leads to a heated argument. The situation is quickly contained by the other gang members stepping in to calm things down. The next day, the tension between the gangs escalates when the Angiolo gang wax Mickey, a member of the Winter Hill gang. This betrayal sparks suspicion in Whitey, leading him to suspect Tommy of being a snitch for the Angiolos. Determined to enforce the gang's cardinal rule against informants, no rats allowed, Whitey orchestrates a grim fate for Tommy. He takes him and the gang to a deserted riverbank where he coldly instructs one of his men to shoot Tommy from behind. Weeks later, Kevin Weeks reveals that he buried Tommy under the Northern Bridge, a spot infamously known as the Bulger Burial Ground for the number of bodies hidden there. During the investigation, Kevin also shares that Whitey's criminal empire remained relatively small until the FBI became involved. The murder of one of Whitey's gang members by the Angiolos was the turning point that led Whitey to accept John Connolly's offer of an alliance. In the following scene, John attempts to convince his boss, McGuire, of his strategy to dismantle the Angiolos by enlisting Whitey as an informant. He suggests overlooking the Winter Hill gang's crimes in exchange for their cooperation. McGuire is initially skeptical given Whitey's notorious background. 
However, Morris, another FBI agent, supports the plan, convincing McGuire to agree. The agreement comes with a significant condition, they must refrain from drug trafficking and killing people to enjoy the FBI's protection. Later, John and Whitey meet to meticulously discuss the conditions of Whitey's cooperation with the FBI, including an agreement that Whitey must refrain from committing any murders. Afterward, Whitey shares the details of this arrangement with Steve, his right-hand man. Steve is initially uneasy about working with the FBI, but Whitey convinces him of the long-term benefits. He emphasizes the freedom they'll have to operate under the FBI's radar and the upper hand they'll gain over rival gangs in Boston. Despite his reservations, Steve is persuaded by Whitey's vision. Soon, Whitey faces a personal crisis. He visits his wife and discovers their son is seriously ill. With a heavy heart, he urges her to take their son to the doctor immediately. The narrative then shifts to a Christmas dinner where Whitey, John, and Billy's families are gathered in celebration. The festive mood is abruptly cut short for Whitey when he receives a phone call that sends him hurrying to the hospital. At the hospital, a distraught Lindsay meets Whitey with devastating news, their son has Ray's syndrome. Through tears, she admits her guilt, explaining that she accidentally gave him the wrong medication, which worsened his condition. Despite the shock and sadness, Whitey wraps her in his arms, offering words of comfort and reassurance. The following day brings a devastating update from Lindsay, their son is now in a brain-dead state. With a heavy heart, she brings up the agonizing decision to consider removing the life support to end his suffering. However, Whitey reacts with intense anger, accusing her of being heartless for even considering ending their son's life. Lindsay confronts Whitey with a bitter truth, calling him a hypocrite. She stresses the cruel irony in his outrage, pointing out that it's Whitey who has lived by taking the lives of others without remorse, not her. With these words, she leaves, leaving Whitey alone with his turmoil. Overcome with a mix of grief and rage, Whitey stands up, his emotions boiling over. He begins to overturn the chair and table, his actions echoing the pain in his heart. By 1981, with the FBI unwittingly in their corner, Whitey's gang sees unprecedented growth in both influence and operations. This newfound power isn't just for show, it's a means to an end, funneling wealth directly into Whitey's pockets. As their financial influence expands, so does their ability to bribe corrupt government officials with cash and lavish trips, designed to secure their loyalty or silence. However, the expansion of his criminal empire and the accumulation of wealth come at a personal cost for Whitey. The death of his son marks a turning point, casting a long shadow over his life. The grief is unbearable, leading to an irreparable rift between him and his wife, Lindsay. Whitey doesn't limit his ambitions to Boston, he extends his operations to Miami, South Florida, where he forges alliances with figures like John Callahan and Brian Halloran. Brian Halloran, portrayed as a more ruthless character, is shown committing a violent act by shooting two people in a Chinese restaurant. Underscoring the ruthless nature of Whitey's associates and the lengths they will go to protect their interests. The tension escalates when McGuire confronts John over the lack of actionable intelligence against the Angelos. Feeling the pressure, John turns to Whitey, who has been holding back information. After a heated exchange, Whitey concedes, directing John to a barbershop on 98th Street as a critical lead. The very next day, John is handed photographs of the Angelo stronghold, located precisely where Whitey mentioned. Armed with this new intel, the FBI swiftly installs wiretaps around the area. The recordings they capture are a gold mine, revealing the Angelos amid their criminal dealings and providing the FBI with the evidence they desperately needed. John is hailed as a hero within the FBI for securing evidence vital to taking down a notorious mafia boss. This success strengthens the partnership between John and Whitey, drawing them into a closer alliance. Yet this bond does not sit well with everyone. John's wife, witnessing the deepening ties between her husband and Whitey, voices her concerns. She urges John to sever his connections with Whitey, but John refuses, insisting that his loyalty to his friend from Southie outweighs her worries. Meanwhile, the story shifts to the world of sports and crime as World Jaya Lai falls under the control of Roger Wheeler. John Callahan, worried about Wheeler's potential interference in their operations, brings his concerns to Whitey. Without hesitation, Whitey sees only one solution to the problem, Wheeler has to go. He suggests the idea of taking him out. Seeing Brian's reluctance to stay quiet about the Wheeler situation, Whitey decides to buy his silence, offering him $20,000 to disappear. Despite initially trying to buy Brian's silence with money, Whitey ultimately views him as too great a risk to their operations, fearing that Brian might cooperate with the authorities and reveal incriminating information about their dealings, including their involvement with the IRA and other criminal enterprises. The decision is made, and the bloody job of eliminating Wheeler falls to Martirano. He finds Wheeler in the vulnerable setting of a golf course parking lot. There, with calculated precision, 
he carries out the hit, ensuring Wheeler can no longer pose a threat to Whitey and his empire. The news of Wheeler's murder shakes Brian to the core, making him physically ill. Overwhelmed by guilt and fear, he decides to testify against Whitey, revealing everything to Morris and John. In an attempt to shield Whitey, John persuades Morris and another FBI colleague that Brian's accusations are baseless, claiming he's just yapping due to the effects of cocaine. The following day, during the St. Patrick's Day parade where Billy is delivering a speech about a clean and crime-free community, John questions Whitey about his possible role in Wheeler's murder. Whitey denies any involvement, stating that he has no business in Florida. However, this question triggers Whitey's awareness that Brian was the one who betrayed him. The next day, while sitting in a car with a friend, Brian is suddenly ambushed by Whitey, who shoots and kills Brian's friend in a brutal display of power. Whitey drags Brian from the car and, despite Brian's desperate pleas for mercy, coldly shoots him dead too. The echo of gunshots spreads panic, causing bystanders to scream in terror. As 1982 dawns, the saga of crime and betrayal continues to unfold. John and Whitey head to Miami to wrap up their dealings with World Jialai, where Whitey decides to tie up loose ends. In the most final way possible, Whitey murders John Callahan, leaving his lifeless body hidden in the trunk of Callahan's own car, a chilling message to anyone who might cross him. Outside a police station, Whitey and Steve find themselves in a tense situation as they wait to pick up Steve's stepdaughter, Deborah, a prostitute who seems to have stumbled upon information she shouldn't possess. After her release, Whitey, sensing her potential knowledge of police matters, decides to take her to his house for a private interrogation. The situation takes a horrifying turn when Whitey, convinced of her liability, strangles her to death in a secluded room. Steve, witnessing the act, is visibly disturbed and upset but finds himself paralyzed, unable to intervene. The arrival of a new federal prosecutor, Fred Wyshak, at the Boston FBI headquarters poses a new threat to Whitey's operations. Wyshak shows a sharp interest in dismantling Whitey's criminal network. When John attempts to bring him into their circle with an invitation to a Red Sox game, Wyshak declines, focusing instead on probing the extent of Whitey's connections. He questions whether Whitey is protected by his influential brother Billy, suggesting it is a reason why Whitey has evaded police capture. John, however, dismisses the idea, insisting Billy is uninvolved in their criminal activities. In 1985, Whitey is hit hard by his mother's death and shows up at her funeral looking crushed. After the funeral, he and his brother Billy are at home, talking about how eerily quiet things feel without their mom around. Kevin Weeks tells Olin that losing his son and then his mom really changed Whitey, now all he cares about is his alliance with the IRA. Whitey pledges to provide them with weapons, a crucial aspect of this newfound partnership. Later on, Whitey, Steve, and Morris are enjoying dinner at John's house. As they eat, Whitey compliments the steak's flavor and asks about the recipe. Morris, in a light-hearted manner, responds that it's a family secret. Initially hesitant, Morris eventually spills the beans about the secret recipe. Whitey, displeased, asks him how he can just give up a family secret that quickly, suggesting that perhaps he'd be as quick to expose their deeper, darker secrets too. Morris becomes a bit nervous, however, Whitey breaks into laughter, revealing that he was only joking. During the gathering, Whitey asks about John's wife, Marion, wondering why she's not with the group. John explains she's not feeling well, but the truth is that Marion feels uncomfortable around the gangsters. Whitey, curious, heads to Marion's room. His approach is intimidating as he questions her absence, making Marion feel both anxious and scared by his presence. McGuire starts to doubt John's close ties with Whitey, causing some unease in their circle. Things take a turn for the worse when John McIntyre, one of Whitey's guys, decides to talk to the FBI about Whitey's IRA connections. When Whitey finds out about McIntyre's snitching, he deals with him harshly, staying true to his zero tolerance for traitors. The arrival of Wyshak spelled trouble for the Winter Hill gang. It was clear he meant business. Morris, nervous about how things were unfolding, decided to cut a deal with the FBI. He snitched on John and Whitey, telling them everything he knew in exchange for protection. Facing the inevitable, Whitey had a final meetup with John. John accused Whitey of using him, but Whitey countered, saying their relationship was a mutual alliance that benefited them both. Not long after, the law caught up with Steve Martorano and Kevin, who were all arrested. John didn't escape the sweep either, as the police nabbed him right in his apartment. During an interrogation, Agent Olson probed Steve for his take on Whitey. Without mincing words, Steve labeled Whitey as strictly criminal. Meanwhile, Billy found himself in a tense moment in his office when Whitey called him. In their conversation, Whitey told Billy to look after himself, hinting it might be the last time they spoke to each other. After this heavy exchange, Whitey made his exit from Boston, disappearing for good. 
In the final part of the story, Kevin Weeks and John Martirano decided to testify against Whitey, a move that significantly reduced their prison time to just a few years. Stephen Flemmy, implicated in 10 murders, wasn't as fortunate and received a life sentence. Whitey's brother Billy, caught in the fallout from his association with Whitey, was forced to resign from his prestigious position. Despite this setback, he managed to turn things around and later became the president of the University of Massachusetts, marking a new chapter in his life. John Connolly, on the other hand, faced his own downfall. Convicted of second-degree murder in the killing of John Callahan, he received a harsh 40-year sentence. This underscored the grave repercussions for those entangled with Whitey's underworld dealings. The movie ends with an old man wearing a white hat blending into the crowd of a sunny California neighborhood. This is Whitey, now a far cry from the powerful gangster he once was in Boston. Despite his attempts to live under the radar, his past caught up with him. The FBI, after years of searching, finally busted him outside his apartment, ending one of the most notorious manhunts in U.S. history. Whitey Bulger was captured in 2011 in Santa Monica, California, after being on the run for 16 years. The tip that led to his arrest came from a former Miss Iceland. She recognized Whitey and his longtime girlfriend, Catherine Gregg, from their time living in the same neighborhood as well as from the media coverage associated with the FBI search for Bulger. She saw a segment on the television show America's Most Wanted that featured Whitey and Catherine, which prompted her to contact the FBI with information about their whereabouts. This tip was crucial in finally arresting Whitey, who was living under the alias Charles Gasco at the time of his arrest. At his trial, Whitey was found guilty and sentenced to two life sentences plus years for his extensive criminal activities, closing the book on his reign of terror.